Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Woman on the Stairs by Marjorie Lawrence I've always been fond of my sister-in-law. My brother Arnold had been something of a connoisseur of women when he was a young man, and had helped to pull him out of one or two rather spectacular affairs. So when he ultimately married a plump, ordinary-looking little woman, a few years his elder, without even a handsome income behind her to compensate for her ordinariness, I was surprised, and tempted to wonder how long the marriage would last. But though Arnold had proved a fool over his lights of love, he was wiser than I had dreamed of when he chose a wife. For Dolly Forrester was a dear in every sense of the word. Not clever, but sound and sane as a nut, sweet-tempered kindly, and as capable as they come. The marriage couldn't have been a more successful one. And when they had two children, first a boy, who has nothing to do with his story, and then a girl, their cup, to write dramatically, was filled to the brim with happiness. Yet it was through the girl, some years later, that the cup was so imperiled that it was almost broken, and if it hadn't been for Miles Penoyer. But I'm going to the end of the story before I have even begun it, so I will go back to where I started and tell things in due order as they came. Arnold was a very successful barrister, and he and Dolly had a pretty flat in a tall block at Amherst Court, Kensington. Not a very modern one, but the rooms were larger than most of the Neo's new box-sized flats, which was one of the reasons why when Arnold's practice improved and his income with it, they remained there instead of moving to a more modern apartment. Dolly had made it extremely comfortable and they had a good general, an old personal maid of Dolly's who was devoted to her and to the family as a whole. They stuck the war out there and were lucky to escape with only a few broken windows. Arnold was an air raid warden and Dolly worked in the canteens and hospitals and refugee centers and God knows what all, while Lance and Pamela were packed off to relatives in Scotland where they had a thoroughly good time being, luckily for them, too young to understand anything about the war. When it was all over, the children came back, not too eagerly, I gathered, and life, as Dolly put it, got back into shape again. She and Arnold were popular and went out a good deal and in return did a certain amount of modest entertaining. They went to occasional shows or films, concerts, and so on, and played golf, bridge, and canasta well enough to be invited out quite a lot on the strength of their playing. Arnold drove a smart little Hummer, and altogether one could not have imagined a pleasanter or more average sort of middle-class couple than Arnold and his wife. Yet, to this very average pair, happened one of the most extraordinary adventures on record in my list of strange cases. When the children returned from Scotland, they went back to school, of course, and Lance, the boy, was at Stowe when this story really started. He was about 14, and Pamela, three years younger. I was fond of both children, but especially of Pamela, who was my godchild. She was as pretty as Dolly was plain, and as she grew older, she saw signs of growing prettier still. Even as a baby, she was small-boned and slender, lint-haired and fair as mother of pearl, with long, narrow hands and feet and throat. She got these from the Latimer side. The Foresters were all like Dolly, solid, chunky little people with stubby, capable hands, short-necked and square-built as highland cattle. Pamela had eyes the color of an aquamarine, all of which may sound insipid, but somehow she wasn't. I think it was her spirit her sense of humor, and the irrepressible gaiety that was an essential part of her that offset the delicate pallor of her coloring. For even as a child, she was brimful of fun and laughter, forever on the go, an electric spark if ever there was one. She and I were the greatest of friends, and when Arnold and Dolly decided that things in Europe had quieted down sufficiently to send her over to France to school to learn the language at the tender age of 11, I missed the child badly 
and treasured her occasional letters, letters as full of fun and vitality as she was herself, though shockingly bad spelt and punctuated. She spent two years in France, and then she went to Austria to learn German. I saw her only occasionally during those years, when she was at home for the holidays, and saw that she was shooting up into a slender reed of a girl, with even greater promise of beauty than I had expected. But she was still so much the child I had known and loved, beneath the surface veneer of sophistication that she was acquiring with so many pains. Eager, impulsive, emotional, just at the stage of life, when a young thing is reaching out towards maturity, yet still teeters uncertainly on the borders of adolescence. I know it's view you to view the outworn phrase that starts standing with reluctant feet, and yet it describes that stage of a girl's life better than anything else I know. The stage where she is still partly a child and partly a teenager, yet just beginning to grow up into a woman. I had no idea that she had returned from Schloss Marhausen. Until one day I had been in court listening to Arnold defending a case. He was a fine advocate, and even had he not been my brother, I would have gone to hear him, and meeting him outside, he invited me to go back to the flat with him to dinner. Thank goodness, even with post-war difficulties of food and drink, Dolly never went temperamental on him if he brought back an unexpected friend to dinner. It was in his car as we were driving back to Amherst Court that Arnold mentioned casually that Pamela had come home. I was surprised, as it was not the end of term by any means, only about halfway through November, and I asked, how come? Arnold shrugged his shoulders. It appeared that there had been a sudden epidemic of some fever or other, very infectious, and Dolly had panicked and wired for Pamela to come home, a suggestion with which the headmistress of the Schloss had been only too glad to comply, as apparently Half the school was down with this disease, whatever it was, and some of the staff as well, so she was thankful to have at least one pupil taken off her hands. Pamela had been home several days, and Arnold said that he did not think they would send her back again. She had been there 18 months, and she was speaking passably good German now, and did not seem necessary. I nodded my head and agreed with him, and when we arrived at Amherst Court, I went up to their comfortable first floor flat in high spirits. Dolly was there, hospitably dispensing more drinks than were quite decent to display. I felt with gin at its post-war price, and so was Pamela. Grown really tall now and prettier than ever with her silver fair hair darkened to a pale gold and done over both ears in two plated wheels, German fashion, which may not have been smart, but suited her wonderfully. She had put on a good deal of weight, too. She was positively chubby, and in the blue Durndal skirt she was wearing and a wide black belt with a short sleeve white muslin blouse she looked altogether like a real German madchen. She flung herself into my arms and hugged me fervently and we all talked nineteen to the dozen before through and after dinner interrupting each other, disputing, laughing, teasing and generally making the cheerful din that means a family reunion. Fourteen as Pamela was now, Dolly packed her ruthlessly off to bed soon after dinner. They had spent the last two days shopping as Pamela had not only grown out of most of her clothes, but those she had bought in Austria were so emphatically Austrian in style that Dolly said she could impossibly take about a child who looked like something out of White Horse Inn, if anybody remembers that charming musical show of pre-war days. So off Pamela went, and both Dolly and Arnold looked after her as she disappeared with a smug approval of two thoroughly satisfied parents, and I must say I couldn't blame them. I lighted my cigar. Thank goodness Arnold is a judge of both drinks and tobacco, and said what I was expected to say, though for once it was true. Well, folks, I congratulate you. Pam looks grand, blooming and full of spirits and as pretty as paint. Some chap's going to be a lucky man one day. Dolly was staring into the fire. She smiled as I spoke and nodded her head rather wistfully. It doesn't seem possible, does it, to imagine once children married? She said, but there it is. Lance is doing well at Stowe. His voice is just breaking and sounds so comic. Poor boy. He's awfully sensitive about it, and now Pam's back with us and halfway a woman now. But not quite, said Arnold, firmly clamping his teeth about the butt of his cigar. I've no intention of letting Pam grow up before she needs to, and that's one of the reasons I've decided not to let her go back to the Schloss. It was all right when she was still a child, comparatively speaking, but now she's growing up. I want her to be more with her mother. He smiled across at Dolly. 
and patted her plump little knee as he went on. If she's half as good as Dolly, here when she grows up, Jerry, I'll say some chap's going to be lucky, I laughed. Time had been when I wondered at Arnold's obvious affection for his plain little wife, but I had long given up wondering and tended to envy him instead. Is she really fluent in German now, I asked, and Dolly looked over at me. That's the only thing that worried me a little, she confessed. I wondered if I were doing the right thing in taking her away. Maybe she should have stayed there until her German was at least as good as her French, but it isn't as yet, of course. She needed another year to get really fluent, but Arnold was so insistent, and anyway, now I'm not worrying, I've found the way for Pam to keep on with her German, right here, in this very building. She nodded her neatly waved little head in triumph, and I looked my interest as she went on. There's a foreign woman, a Russian, living on the floor just above us, at least not on the floor itself, at the turn of the stairs it is, and she's willing to give Pam lessons in German for a very reasonable sum. We'd known her by sight for some time, but didn't know her name. We called her the woman on the stairs, and found afterwards that the porters all called her that, as she's got one of those unpronounceable Russian names. She seems to speak a dozen different languages, so isn't it lucky Pam can stay at home and still perfect her German? And later on, the princess says she'll take her in Italian if she likes. Says that Pam has a natural flair for languages. Pam is delighted, and so are we. I elevated my eyebrows. One of Dolly's minor foibles is an innocent sort of snobbery, and she adores a title. I could hear her rolling princess over on her tongue as a child rolls a lollipop. Princess, hmm, I said, moving in high circles, are we? How did you meet her? Only the other day. As a matter of fact, it was Pam who got acquainted with her, said Dolly. The princess had been out shopping. She's quite poor now, though she's been very rich, and she's still got some lovely things, and she dropped her shopping basket in the hall, just as Pam was coming in. Of course, the child helped her to collect the things, and she was so pleased that she took her back into her flat and gave her cakes and coffee and got talking to her. And, well, that's how it all started. I glanced over at Arnold. He met my glance, smiled faintly, and nodded, and got up to bring in the whiskey and soda, which was always left handy on a tray in the kitchen when the maid went to bed. As he carried it in, he remarked, It's quite okay, Jerry. I've checked on the lady's credentials. She gave me enough to supply a whole corps of diplomats. She's the real thing, all right. Princess Olga Alexander Euphemia Yurikov Stavosky, no less. A very old family related to the Galencines, and even more blue-blooded, if possible. I accepted the drink, and he poured out for me. I suppose she's the usual refugee from the revolution, I said. If so, she must be a woman of a certain age, as the French so gracefully put it. Well, her family were ruined and driven out at that time, with so many others, said Arnold. But she was only a child then. They went to Paris, where they had relations and somehow managed to get along there until the princess grew up and married a Frenchman, the Vicomte de la Croix. They had no family, I gather. When the war came, the La Croix was with the resistance lot and got caught and killed. She was working with them, too, till the Germans got wise to her, and then she had to get out as quickly as she could and came to England with only about what she stood up in. Oh, yes. There's nothing phony about the fair Olga. You can bet your boots on that, or I would not have dreamt of consenting to let Pam take lessons from her. Does she give private lessons or take classes, I asked. Oh, private, said Dolly quickly, and she's got several pupils. But she's very particular whom she takes. Lady Earl's girl goes to her and Mrs. Hare Limington's Editha and, oh, several others, all private lessons. The princess doesn't believe in classes, says she can't give individual attention to each pupil. Well, well, I said, it all sounds excellent. How long has Pam been going to her? Oh, I forgot. She can only just have started, of course, as she's only got back last week. She hasn't even started yet, said Dolly. I only fixed things up two days ago. She begins on Monday. There came a tap at the door, and a rich voice spoke. A voice mellow, foreign, charming, the voice of a woman. May I come in, please? Talk of the devil, said Arnold, and in an aside as he went to open the door, and Dolly scrambled to her feet, smoothing down the front of her red brocade house coat as she did so and giving me an eloquent glance. It was evident that she was pleased as punch for a princess to prove herself sufficiently intimate with her to come knocking on the door without ceremony. And I admit that I was curious by now to see the woman 
who was destined to play mentor to my pretty goddaughters, Telemaca. The door opened and in swept a tall and impressive looking woman, white skin, red haired, hook nose, clad in flying draperies of black, and carrying in her arms a bundle of books. She halted dramatically on the threshold, and a pair of keen eyes swept the room, dwelt for a moment on me, and came to rest on Dolly's beaming face. Ah, madame, you forgive? I ring the bell and ring, but no reply, and then I try the door, and lo, it opened, and I venture in, and I hear voices, and I venture more, and so she rustled forward to the fire, deposited the bundle of books on the small table that held Dolly's coffee cup, and sitting down the settee, beside her opened the first book in a business-like manner. When we talked the other day, madame, I forget these, most important. I have marked the passages our little Pam should learn, if you will show. Her large, capable hands turned the pages swiftly and showed penciled markings, turned down pages, inserted slips of paper, and Dolly nodded eagerly as she followed the pointing finger. We men remained silent watching her, and when she had finished, Arnold interrupted Dolly's fervent thanks with the offer of a drink. She turned her red head and smiled engagingly up at him. But yes, my friend, with pleasure, especially if you have cognac, yes? Ah, Wondershawn, you have the taste and the knowledge of the drinks one can see as few Englishmen have. And who is this? Her eyes raked me from head to foot, sharp, hard, dark eyes beneath a bush of rusty red hair arranged in a forehead fringe a la Sarah Bernhardt, a fashion so old that for all I knew, it might come in again. Dolly, who had plainly been too knocked all of a heap by this unexpected arrival to introduce me, hastened to perform the presentation, and remembering my European experiences, I bent over the white hand extended to me and touched lips to the handsome diamond ring that encircled the third finger. The lady smiled, plainly well pleased, and remarked, appreciatively that few Englishmen has such graceful manners, accepted the glass of cognac that Arnold had poured out for her, but refused to allow Dolly to make fresh coffee and proceeded to talk. But talk. It had to be admitted that she talked well, and though in effect it was a monologue, it was so cleverly managed with such adroit and tactful pauses for suitable questions, comments, exclamations, so on, that to many people it would not seem a monologue at all. I listened, fascinated. It was plain, that here was a woman widely traveled, widely read, more than well educated, a woman who had endured and surmounted adventures, experiences, dangers of all sorts without allowing them to affect her sense of humor, courage, or tolerance, a woman who must have been a beauty once, and who still retained a measure of that beauty, a woman who had lived royally, and who still, poor as she was now, gave the impression of royalty. I studied her under my eyebrows as she talked, and wondered what her age was. She was that curious ageless type that one sees sometimes in Europe, especially among the older generation of Russian women. She might have been barely 50 or she might have well been over 60. It was impossible to tell. The handsome imperious face was little lined, yet it had an oddly mask-like look, which might have been due to the heavy makeup she wore, pale powder thickly applied, eyelids darkened with purple fard, and bordered with black mascara and lips of vivid orange-red, which, while theatrical, was undeniably effective with her tousled, rust-colored hair. She had the high cheekbones and faintly slanting eyes of the Russian, and she used her large white hands with the nails painted the same orange-red as her lipstick, effectively to illustrate the points of her stories. Altogether, she was a picturesque and arresting creature, and obviously going out of her way to be charming to the family of her new pupil. Then why on earth did I have that faint sense of recoiling, as if from something... I did not altogether trust. I watched her and listened to her, now and then contributing my small quota to the talk so as not to be conspicuous by my silence. Yet in the end, when she rose to go with a gracious bow, she, for me and to Arnold and an affectionate pressure of the hand to the gratified Dolly, I found my impression not a whit changed. As Arnold went to show her out of the front door, Molly turned to me and said breathlessly, Isn't that lucky? I was dying for you to meet her. Now, what do you think of her? Arnold came into the room just as I replied. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Dolly, but I don't like her. Not like her? Dolly's voice rose to a positive squeak of disappointment and dismay. What on earth do you mean, Jerry? How can you not like her? Nobody could be nicer than she was to you. 
Arnold, pouring himself out a last whiskey and soda, looked at me to his surprise, disapproval, but I stuck to my guns. I'm sorry, I said firmly. I can't give you any reason, so don't ask me, but there it is. There's something about the lady I don't like. Arnold looked at me with raised eyebrows. If you were the ordinary dyed-in-the-wool Britisher Jerry, he said, I'd say it was just prejudice against a foreigner, but you aren't like that. You spent years abroad and like foreigners. I shook my head. Don't ask me to explain it, I said. I'm not suggesting that she isn't a real princess or anything like that. I know your thoroughness too well, Arnold, to think that a fake would get past you. No, it's something else. Something I can't account for. It's... She gives me a queer feeling that I don't want to get too close to her any more than I would want to a snake. Sorry, but there it is. Dolly got up with a little vexed flounce. Oh, well, she said over one shoulder. All I can say is, Jerry, for goodness sake, don't go saying anything about not liking her to Pam. You know how easy it is to prejudice kids of her age. And it's most important she should go on liking the princess and wanting to study with her. At present, she thinks she's marvelous and is awfully impressed. So leave it at that, will you? I nodded. Long afterwards, I wish I had not given Dolly that implied promise, but had done my best to put Pam against a prospective mentor from the very first, but there was no way of guessing how things were likely to work out. Now, as it happened, it was some time before I saw Arnold and Dolly and Pam again. I went abroad with my old friend Penoyer to Brittany for a holiday, so it was some two months or more before I went again to Amherst Court. Since I came back to find a sea of work piled up and waiting for me, I might not have gone then if it had not been that I had run by accident into Pamela herself, coming back from doing some shopping in Kensington High Street for her mother. I thought, but I was wrong. She was wearing the blue dirndl skirt and white blouse that I remembered. It was hot weather and probably the coolest thing she possessed, and had it not been for that and the plaited wheels of hair over her ears, I doubt if I would have recognized Pam, for she had changed so much. She had lost all the extra weight she had put on in Austria. Not that that would have worried me. It was puppy fat anyway and would have come off as she grew out of adolescence. But it was something else that brought me up with a sharp turn. The look on the child's face. She looked drained is the only word I can think of. Dragged, white, exhausted. And my first reaction was both anger and alarm. What on earth could Dolly be thinking of to let the child get like that? Losing weight was all right but she should surely not have lost it so quickly. And what on earth was behind that look of exhaustion? Pam, I called. Hi, Pam, wait for me. Pamela jumped startled and swung round for a moment. Her old joyous self beamed out at me and her delighted smile. Uncle Jerry, I'm so glad. She held her face up for a kiss. We've been expecting you to drop in ever since you telephoned Dad last week saying you'd come back. I know, I said, tucking her spare hand under my arm. I've got a lot to tell you. Had a grand time with my old friend Miles. Come on, let's turn in here and have an ice, shall we? Tam's eyes gleamed as they were wont to do at the mention of ice cream. But after a moment, she shook her head. I'd love to, but I can't. I've got to get these things back, she indicated the laden basket she was carrying. Oh, that's all right, I said blithely. Your mother will understand. You can explain. Pam frowned and spoke a little awkwardly. I, they aren't for mother, she said. They're for the princess. I, she, I often do some of her shopping for her. She isn't very strong, you know. I stared. Personally, I should have thought that that red-headed six-footer was as strong as a proverbial horse, but maybe I was wrong. Well, I said, surely she can wait a quarter of an hour. You can always say they kept you waiting at the shops. Come on, Pam. I haven't seen you for weeks and weeks. She hesitated for another moment, then nodded, and together we turned into the nearest cafe and ordered strawberry ice cream, cakes, and coffee. Pamela ate with her usual good appetite and answered my questions and even asked a few of her own about my holiday in Brittany, but she was palpably absent-minded and barely seemed to listen to my replies. I watched her as she consumed her ice, ate three cakes, and drank two cups of coffee, and while I was relieved to see that her appetite at least was normal enough, I was far from pleased with other things that I saw as I watched her. She was so queerly quiet and subdued. There was nothing of her old, eager ebullience. The fun and vitality that had been so essential a part of her, all that seemed to have faded out. Her eyes had lost their old sparkle, and there was a curiously blank, unseeing look about them. And sometimes, when she turned to me to respond to a question, she looked at me almost as though she didn't see me. The action was a purely mechanical one, done out of politeness. That was all. 
She didn't turn to me out of interest or desire to hear what I was saying. In losing the extra weight I knew she had detested, her young figure had regained its old slender beauty, but the oval face was now peaked and pallid, and there were faint, bistro-colored shadows beneath the aquamarine eyes. Pam, I said firmly, I don't like the look of you, my child. What have you been doing to yourself, slimming too strictly to get the weight down? For a second, her old smile flashed at me again, but it faded as she shook her head. Oh, no. I haven't been slimming. Mother wouldn't let me. She said it wouldn't come off naturally if I waited, and it did, quite quickly. Too quickly, I'd have said, I said with dissatisfaction. You don't look well, Pam. Feel okay? She nodded in a listless sort of fashion. Oh, yes, I'm perfectly all right. You aren't working too hard? I persisted. For the more I studied the child, the more concern I was beginning to feel about her. There was something unnatural about this change, a change not merely in the body, but mentally as well. Where in this lifeless, mechanically smiling youngster was a vital, laughing, energetic Pam of old? You're sure that new teacher of yours isn't letting you overdo it? Now she was roused to animation. The mention of the princess was like touching a button that suddenly lighted up a darkened room. And I don't know why, but it didn't please me. Didn't please me at all. Oh, goodness, no. Her reply came as quickly as the lash of a whip. I, she's the most marvelous person, Uncle Jerry. I have never met anybody like her at all before. I, she, we all think so, all her pupils, I mean. Are you getting on with your German well under her teaching? I asked. Actually, I wasn't especially interested in her German, but I wanted to study the sudden light in her eyes at the mention of the princess's name, the spurt of animation that had been infused into the listless, apathetic creature that had been Pam until the moment. A faint frown lined her smooth forehead between the twin wheels of flaxen hair. German? She said and looked at me in an oddly questioning way. Yes, German, I said a shade impatiently. Surely that was what you were going to her for, wasn't it? To perfect your German? Oh, yes, yes, of course it was. Pam agreed a shade over eagerly. I thought, oh, I'm getting on very well, she says. Very well, indeed. I looked at her sideways. I was getting very puzzled, and I didn't like being puzzled. Studying anything else with her, I asked. Pam looked at me. I, she's teaching me deportment, she said slowly. How to do a court curtsy and all that sort of thing. She says she'll get me presented at court one day. She knows lots of titled people. And she says it's only a question of pulling strings. Oh, she's marvelous, Uncle Jerry. You have no idea. She was off again, her eyes alight, her voice fervent. It was plain that the little fool had a bad case of heroin worship, such as Bizet's most teenagers, and I was annoyed. I don't know why, but somehow I would prefer to have an emotional fixation on the game's mistress at the Schloss, or on the mother superior of her continent in France, rather than have fastened onto this theatrical princess with a past, and a past and a half, I would have betted. She might well be a downright regular royal princess. She might even have been a heroine of the resistance, but she had been other more murky things as well, or I missed my guess. Well, I said discontentedly, beckoning the waiter over to pay my bill. She may be the cat's whiskers to you, my dear, and you don't look well, and my own opinion is that you're working too hard. I shall tell your mother I think so too. And anyway, why should you run her errands for her in this hot weather? Pamela's hand clutched more tightly the handles of her basket, and her lips took on a mutinous line, but she said nothing, and I made up my mind it was time I saw Dolly. I'd invited myself to dinner again at Amherst Court shortly after my encounter with Pam, but I got little satisfaction out of either Dolly or Arnold. Arnold withdrew into study soon after dinner. He was working on a tough case that had to be prepared practically overnight, and I tackled Dolly at once about Pam, who had not dined with us. She was, Dolly said, importantly having supper with the princess, who, among other things, was a wonderful cook and had promised to show Pamela how to make an omelette. Dolly talked princess practically all through dinner, that is, when Arnold and I were not talking our respective shop. It was plain to me that if Pam was besotted on this confounded woman, her mother was not far behind her. It was the princess this and the princess that. Some marvelous little dressmaker she knew had made Dolly some clothes that were simply wonderful and so cheap. Some brilliant doctor or dentist who at a word from the princess would treat her friend for next to nothing. Some shop or agency or office that would do the same. And regarding Pam, how kind the princess was to Pam. She singled her out and above all her other pupils, no other was ever asked to have supper privately with her, taught her to cook and embroider. 
She showed her how to make a real court curtsy. It was really marvelous how she had taken to Pam and how Pam had taken to her, and what a chance that was for Pam. Poor as she might be, the princess was an aristocrat to her fingertips and knew everybody who was anybody in London. And when it came to the time for bringing Pam out into the world, so it went on and on. And when Arnold left us, I interrupted the spate very firmly. Look here, Dolly. Do you know you've talked nothing about this confounded princess since I came? Dolly looked a trifle confounded and bit her lip. Have I, she confessed. Maybe I have, but you see, she's really rather an absorbing sort of person. She's not like anybody else I've ever known. That's all right, I said, but she needn't become an obsession with you as well as with Pam. Dolly's eyes flew wide and she shook her head protestingly. I really think, Jerry, she said, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. It's quite natural for girls of Pam's age to get a crush on older women. It was bound to happen with somebody or other. And I'm glad it's happened with the princess because under her influence, Pam can learn so much that will be useful to her later on in life. Well, I said, I don't like to change in the girl. She's lost all her old fun and gaiety. And she's got so thin. Dolly laughed outright. You're not really going to suggest, are you, that her getting thin again is due to the princess, she asked. Really, Jerry, isn't that rather silly? It was only puppy fat due to all that rich food in Austria, and it came off just naturally. Her blue eyes met mine squarely. You see, Jerry, I'm very ambitious for Pam. She's going to be a lovely girl, and Arnold and I spent a lot on her education and on Lance's. It's all we can do for our children to launch them in the world, as we haven't got a lot to leave them in the way of money. We're just quiet middle-class people, Jerry, and I don't know anybody influential in society while the princess does. And if she chooses, she can help Pam a lot later on. She can give her useful introductions, get her in touch with good families, see that she meets men worth meeting, maybe help her to get some sort of job where her looks can get her really noticed. Pam wants to go in for dress modeling herself. And of course, that's one of the best ways to get noticed now. It's like being one of the gaiety girls on Father's and Mother's Day. Most of them married into the peerage. I had to stem the torrent again, for Dolly in her efforts to justify her own obvious cultivation, the princess looked like emulating Tennyson's brook and running on forever. I see, I said dryly. You mean you see the princess as a useful leader by which Pam may climb into society. Isn't that rather old world, Dolly? After the war and all its experiences? Dolly squared her stubborn little jaw. Things don't change as much as all that, she said. And every mother in the world wants the best for her daughter and tries every way to get it. I want the best for my Pam. And I believe the princess is going to be a very worthwhile social asset. So I'm going to use her for what she's worth. And I don't care what you say. Even if she's not good for Pam, I ventured. Must she be forever in the woman's pocket? I honestly don't know what you're driving at, Jerry, Dolly said irritably. Pam goes there every day for a German lesson, and quite often the princess asks her in either to supper or to coffee after supper and supervises her homework or gives her hints about all sorts of things like manners and how to talk to people and interest them and all that. And uh, about Pam being quieter in her manner? I hinted the fine script into her tone. Well, maybe that is partly due to the princess, as she told me she thought it would be a good thing to tone down the child's exuberance a little. It wasn't good style to bounce and laugh and shout and get excited as she used to. Good style be hanged, I said rudely. I like Pam better left as she was, a jolly natural kid. And how far is this refining process going, do you know? It's going on until Pam's really polished, as she ought to be, snapped Dolly, losing her temper. I don't care what you say, Jerry. I think this is a marvelous chance for the child. Arnold and I can't afford to send Pam to a really expensive finishing school in Paris as we'd have liked, and to have her finished here by a woman like the princess while she's still under a roof is simply a miracle. I'd be mad not to seize the chance. I compressed my lips. It was plainly no use arguing. Between her natural desire to seize every worldly advantage for her child and her equally strong desire that sprang from her innocent snobbery to cling to the most aristocratic woman she had ever known, Dolly was hell-bent on going her own way, and I was not going to quarrel with her. Well, it's your pigeon, I said, but I don't like it all the same. Where's that whiskey of Arnold's? I need a drink. Dolly went to the kitchen and brought in the tray. As she put it down, she looked at me and her blue eyes were plaintive. I know you think I'm being a fool over this, she said sadly, and I can't get you to understand. I wish you knew the princess better and you'd take a different view of her. Wait a minute. While I poured myself out a drink, she went to her desk 
extracted a minute diary from it and read out a date about two weeks ahead. She's giving a little cocktail party in her flat, six to eight, just a few friends getting together, and she wants us to come. I'm sure she'd be delighted to see you as well. An extra man's always welcome. Why don't you come? If you could get to know her better, I'm sure you wouldn't have this silly prejudice against her. I brighten. This was a good idea. I wanted to get next to the lady, though I doubted whether it would result as Dolly fondly hoped and my instinctive distrust of her giving way before a sudden rush of liking. I made a note of the date in my diary, drank up my whiskey and went off, and just before I left, I put a question to Dolly. If the princess would welcome an extra man, might she not welcome two extra men even more heartily? If I might, I should like to bring my friend Penoyer with me. Penoyer? Your friend? The spook doctor? asked Dolly. She knew and liked Penoyer, though, like many women, she was a little scared of as well as skeptical about his work, such of it as she understood, which was very little. Oh, yes, I'm sure she would, but why do you want to bring him particularly? There aren't any spooks in the princess flat. I hedged. Oh, he doesn't spend his entire life spook hunting, you know, I said. He's quite a social bird in his quiet way and speaks as many languages as the princess. I thought they might get on rather well together. Dolly brightened and nodded her head. That's true, she agreed. Well, do bring him, and I'll tell the princess. Penoyer listened with interest. When I told him my story, my impressions, that is, as there was scarcely anything sufficiently substantial to be called a story as yet. In fact, some years earlier, I probably would not have ventured to tell him about it at all, fearing I was, as Dolly had said, making mountains out of molehills. But Penn had so often encouraged me to record and report to him my impressions, even very vague and fleeting ones, telling me that I sensed more rightly than I knew when things were psychically wrong, that I lost my old shyness and self-distrust, and made no bones of telling him in detail all I felt about the matter that was puzzling me, as this certainly was. He heard me out to the end and then nodded. I'll come with you with pleasure, he said, and meet this good lady. But first, I'll build a protective shell about myself so she can't pick up any waves of psychic powers and be on the alert. Make yourself into an ordinary man, in fact, I joked. But even as I joked, I knew that even with his psychic powers cloaked, Miles Penoyer would never be an ordinary man. One look into those deep-set, steady eyes at that lean brown face with a strong chin and the tender, sensitive mouth told one that there was an exceptional man indeed, one of the great ones of the world who live only to serve their fellow men. Penn nodded and smiled. It may not be necessary, of course, he said. The princess may merely be a remarkably strong character, before whom both mother and daughter are at the moment doing the hero-worshipping act, rather foolishly, but probably quite harmlessly, and in that case, one can do nothing but wait until it wears off, and Pam and Dolly both come to their senses. On the other hand, I'm inclined to pay attention to your hunches. They are often a definite lead, and if there is anything in my line about this business, I should obviously look into it, if I can do so quietly and unobtrusively. That's all I can say at the moment. Okay, Jerry, I'll come with you on the 23rd. The princess's notion of a small and intimate cocktail party was not mine. As Penoyer and I ascended the stairs of her flat, we could hear the roar of voices high above us and the clink and rattle of glasses. We looked at each other and Penoyer grimaced. The last thing in the world he would normally choose to go to was a cocktail party, but today he was being an ordinary man. The princess's flat was one of those situated on the turn of the stairs that led from one floor up to another. The building was so constructed that there was one of these small flats at each corner of the block on each floor, reached by two or three odd steps that led up to the front door from the angle where the first flight of steps turned sharply to the second flight. The door was propped open, and we could see from the mist of smoke inside that the place was crowded. However, we were in for it now and pushed our way into the mob of men and women that seeped inside, looking round first for our hostess, then for a corner where we might possibly get a drink and smoke together. It was a larger flat than I had at first anticipated and consisted, I subsequently discovered, of three rooms, one large one in which we were all congregated and two smaller ones that served the princess as a bedroom and a pocket-sized dining room. There was a strong smell of some eastern incense, and indeed the whole place was definitely eastern in flavor. A pierced bronze lamp, the size and shape of a football, hung from the center of the ceiling. There was a wide divan in one corner covered with a handsome Chinese shawl 
in purples, reds, and greens, and on the wall behind it hung a shabby but beautiful Persian rug in silk, the Tree of Life pattern, which must have been worth a good deal for all its shabbiness. There was a piano, also draped with another Chinese shawl, but in orange and blue this time. This was laden with photographs in silver frames, and more photographs crowded the high mantelpiece, photographs mainly of women in elaborate court evening dress and men in magnificent uniforms, mostly of old Russia and the days of the Tsars, the majority of them being sprawling signatures. There was a gilded Buddha on a carved and lacquered shelf and two incense sticks smoldering in a brass jar beside him, and a litter of eastern curios and ornaments along the top of the bookcases, which lined two walls of the room, and the door that plainly led into the princess's bedroom was discreetly hidden behind a fine mushrab screen, such as one may still pick up if one is lucky in the back streets of Cairo, Port Said, or Alexandria. An odd room, a cluttered room, I might say, and yet a room that breathed personality as its, its owner did. She was standing in a corner talking with a great animation to a group of people, and then not see us for a moment, which I was glad about, as it gave Penn a chance of sizing her and her surroundings up before she noticed him. She wore a usual black velvet this time, but it was brightened up today by a flaming scarf of Italian striped silk in vivid crimsons and purples and greens, and she wore enormous dangling earrings of emerald set in silver and a great oval-shaped brooch to match pinned in her breast. Old Russian jewelry, one could see it at once from its style. In her crest of henna red and hair, there nodded and sparkled another piece of valuable jewelry, a dragonfly with outspread wings, its body a serrated row of emeralds, its eyes made of rubies and its wings a lacework of many colored jewels. Flamboyant as it was, it was a lovely piece of work of its kind, and though it would have looked appallingly outre on many women, Somehow this woman, with her essentially dramatic quality, managed to carry it off. Just then, Pam's voice came at my elbow, eager, excited. She was carrying a tray of luscious-looking little snacks, stuffed eggs, prawns in aspic, anchovies sitting on cucumber slices, sections of celery filled with cream cheese. You know, that sort of thing. She was plainly playing waitress to help the prince's little maid, and though this fresh proof of her servitude to her teacher annoyed me, I was pleased to see her for once bright and animated as of old and congratulated her on the excellent quality of the canapes, many of which she proudly told us she had prepared herself. Penoyer, whom she knew and liked, smiled at her as he accepted one, and I followed his example when suddenly a voice, rich, mellow, delightful, spoke in our ears. Our hostess had spotted us at last. Ach, it is Mr. Latimer, I think, the brother of Cher Madame Latimer. And your friend, no? So charmed, so pleased. I hastily performed the necessary introduction and saw the hard, dark eyes dwell reflectively on Penn, pass him over with an effect a shrug and turn again on me. It was plain that Penoyer had made himself with imminent success into an ordinary man. The princess went on, one large hand resting possessively on Pam's slender shoulder as she stood close to her. This child, see how she helps me. I cannot do without her at any of my parties. See she made with me most of these things to eat. So nice. She chose a prawn canopy, popped it into her large mouth, and went on talking as Pam beamed her pleasure at the praise. Penoyer accepted another canopy, shook his head at the tray of cocktails that had just appeared, and asked for a glass of fruit juice or soda water and listened as the lady continued. You will not find your brother and his wife as yet, Mr. Latimer. They come later on, they say, but I beg of you, eat and drink all you will and amuse yourself. Here are some of my dearest friends. We get together now and then, as you call it, those of us who are still alive and talk over old times. Like the play Reunion in Vienna, remarked Penoyer in German, and the princess beamed delightfully. Ach so, you are a linguist. How wonderful. So few Englishmen speak any language but their own, though since the word is better. Nikwa? So many years on the continent, even Englishmen had to try and learn a little of other languages. Her keen eyes bored into Penoyer's. You speak my own tongue, perhaps, Professor Russian? You are a professor, or perhaps a mistake? Penoyer said that perhaps one might fairly call him a professor of the mind rather than of the body. And yes, he did speak Russian. The princess screamed out the information at the top of a delighted voice, at which several compatriots of hers turned and came over to us. And presently we found ourselves the center of an interested group all rattling away in Russian. Penoy was plainly the success of the evening. I wandered away when Dolly and Arnold arrived, 
I can't speak Russian, so I left things to pen. Dolly and the princess fell on each other's necks as women do, and Dolly, finding a spare chair, she had a genius for finding somewhere to sit where nobody else could possibly do so, sat herself down and looked about her with great satisfaction. She might as well be satisfied as the air was positively dark with titles. Though it was plain, they were mostly continental titles, and their owners, poor devils, pretty poor and shabby. But there was much foreign talk and foreign manners, hand-kissing, shoulder-shrugging, and gestulating, and introductions of Madame la Comtesse, this and that, the Margravine, and so on, and most of the crowd of photographs were signed with royal, or at least near royal names. So Dolly was in high feather, and looking as nearly pretty as she could look in a becoming navy and white printed shantung frog and loose coat and little hat to match. She greeted me with a beaming smile and a meaning glance towards Pam, still standing beside the princess with the latter's hand on her shoulder. For a moment we watched the two, the young girl and the tall imperious woman whose hand lay possessively on her shoulder. Pam was wearing a beige frock and beige colored sandals and it struck me then that she seemed even thinner than when I had seen her last the excitement had lent a spurious touch of color to her cheeks, and the princess's obvious approval had brought a sparkle to her eyes. But somehow, somewhere, that odd sense of doubt, of distrust, was still working within me, and not all the princess's graciousness, and she had gone out of her way to be gracious, could do anything to remove that feeling. I glanced over at Penoyer, still talking to his group of Russians, met his appealing glance, and knew what it meant. Haven't we stayed long enough? I've got all I wanted." I nodded and said to Dolly mendaciously, What a shame you and Arnold came so late, because I'm afraid it's a case of hello and goodbye for Penn and me. We've been here a good while, and we'll have to go now. Penn's got an urgent case waiting. Dolly's face fell. Oh, but... She began, but I was having no buts. I was too keen to hear what sort of an impression Penn had got out of the princess and her setup. Sorry, I said firmly. It's been a nice party, but you came very late, you know. Let me see. It's Pam's birthday party next week, isn't it? On Thursday, right? Then I'll be seeing you then, and I'll say good night to our hostess and collect Pen, and we'll be on our way. I waited until Pen's car had pulled away from the entrance to the flats, and then burst out with a question I'd been dying to ask for the past hour. Well, what do you think of her? Penor smiled as he skillfully steered the car into the crowded length of Kensington High Street. You always want to rush your fences, Jerry, he said. Leave me alone until we get back to the flat. I want to sort my impressions out quietly. And after dinner, I'll tell you the summing up of those impressions. I felt dashed and subsided. Can't you tell me at least the general atmosphere of those impressions? I said at last. Penn smiled again. All I'm prepared to say at the moment is that your hunches are generally correct. And this one, I'll swear, is correct too. He said slowly at last. Correct in that there is something here I don't like. Something that smells bad, if you know what I mean. But further than that, I can't go. Whether that bad smell arises from a thoroughly nasty mental condition or from a nasty spiritual one, I don't know yet. Now shut up until we get home. I want to think. I lighted up my cigarette and sank back into my suite, knowing it was useless to try and pump my friend further, and we swept smoothly past Derry and Tom's, past Barker's, down Gloucester Road into Chelsea, and so via Chelsea Hospital into the embankment. Penoyer drove fast and well, his soft hat pulled down over his deep-set eyes, his face grave and preoccupied. But though he was driving like a master, I knew that his mind, the major part of it at least, was not even in the car with me. It was concentrated upon the princess, and how desperately anxious I was to know what the result of that concentration was going to be. However, I knew better than to interrupt again and said nothing until the car was safely parked in its accustomed corner of the quaint old-fashioned square where Penn lived, and we had entered the flat where Friedel had already laid the table and set out the accustomed tray of drinks. Hello, I said, as I saw two places laid. How did earth, did Friedel know you were going to bring home a guest? I told her mentally, said Penn Oyer, throwing his hat into a corner and pouring himself out a glass of iced orange juice. She's been with me so long that without realizing it, she picks up mental images or instructions I send her with surprising success. He drank off his orange juice thirstily. She'll tell you she felt it likely that Man Hare would bring home a friend with him. That's all she knows. Pour yourself out a drink, my boy, that is, if you think playing sherry or whiskey and soda will mix safely with those rather doubtful-looking cocktails you're drinking at the princess party. I'll risk it, I said, with a grin, and followed his advice. 
followed it twice to be exact, and then Friedel brought in the dinner. It was good as usual, omelette, frito misto for my benefit, though as usual, Penn contented himself with the vegetable that accompanied that delectable dish and caramel custard, a particular weakness of mine to follow, and we were settled in the sitting room with the coffee before us, and one of the excellent cigars that Penn keeps for his guests clamped between my teeth, I said firmly. Now, I've been a good boy and obeyed orders, Penn, but time's up. Out with your conclusions about this damn princess. Penn stirred his coffee and dropped an extra piece of sugar into it. He has so few ordinary weaknesses that I found his love of sweet things rather appealing. It seemed to bring him a little nearer to the commonplace human being that was myself. I'll tell you this, he said at last that for a long time I was puzzled as to whether the bad psychic smell I picked up was simply a case of a supremely clever and ruthless lesbian having fastened her tentacles on a malleable young girl. But on our way back, things began to get sorted out in my mind, and I'm certain it's not that. Anyway, we can make sure very soon, as soon as we finished our coffee. How can you make sure, I asked with interest. We'll use the globe, said Penoyer. Having been to the ladies' flat, I can tune into our atmosphere without difficulty, and as it's more than likely Pam will be staying behind when the rest of her guests leave in order to help her beloved teacher clear up, we should be able to sit comfortably back here and watch what happens there. As a princess, I had no suspicion whatever that I am other than quite an ordinary man who was brought in as a make-weight. She will not try to protect herself or her flat in any way, so we should have a clear run-in, so to speak." I looked at him with interest. Then you think she's not unacquainted with occultism? He nodded. I'm sure she knows a good deal about it, he said briefly. I sighed. You talk about us looking into the globe, I said, but you've forgotten, you old brute, that I haven't the sight that can see things in the globe. All I ever see in it is a reflection of my own face, and I'm thoroughly tired of that. Pen grinned. Drink up the rest of your coffee and come on, he ordered. Don't you know yet that your old friend is a miracle worker? Dump this tray out in the hall for Friedel to take away and draw the curtains close, and we'll get busy. While well, I put the tray outside and drew the soft tobacco-colored velvet curtains, Pan unlocked the corner cupboard and drew carefully out a large round glass globe on a carved blackwood stand. He placed it on a small table, drew up two comfortable chairs beside it, and turned out all the lights, but a single lamp at the far end of the room. This he draped with a red silk scarf so that all the light it gave out was blurred rosiness in the dusk and felt his way back to the table. Then while I waited, bursting with curiosity to see what he was going to do to me, he came behind me, placed one palm flat across my forehead and the other at the back of my neck and held them there for a few moments. This is where I open the eye in the middle of your forehead, what some people call the pineal gland and others say is the last vestige of what was once a third eye, he said. They are both right in one way and wrong in another, but I haven't time to go into that now. Why your hand on the back of my neck, I asked. Penn tutted at me. You asked me that, Jerry, with your knowledge. You know the five psychic centers well enough. The eye on the forehead, the heart, the navel, the genitals, the base of the skull. There's a close link between the two head centers, and I'm opening them both so that you may see all there is to be seen. Now sit still and let the power flow through. I sat still, and as Penn's strong hands pressed on my head and at the back of my neck, I did indeed feel the flowing of some mysterious power like a faint but distinct electric current, tingling, stimulating. And when I opened my eyes, at last it was something of a shock to see the room and its furniture just as before, clear in the dim red light, the globe poised on its stand before us on the little table. But Penoyer gave me no time to wonder and question. He moved over to the globe and held his long hands outstretched for a moment over it, muttering under his breath some words that I could not distinguish, then withdrew his hands and returned to his seat. Now he said under his breath, we shall see what we shall see. For a few moments the globe remained dark, with only the fair gleam of the lamp reflected in a blurred patch of reddish light on its rounded side. Then suddenly a tiny flame seemed to dawn at the very center of it, the flame grew rapidly larger and brighter, and at last it seemed to fill the globe, as though it was hollow and lighted from within. Then it mellowed to a soft glow, and leaning forward, I began to see in it various odd things, seen as through a shifting mist, a chair and a table, the long shape of a divan piled with cushions, and two figures moving about. 
The mist cleared, and I saw that I was looking into the sitting room of the princess flat. The room had so recently been filled with people drinking, talking, laughing, but now it was empty but for two figures. The figure of young Pamela, busy clearing away what was evidently the remains of a picnic supper, and that of the princess. She had changed her dress and put on a sort of lounging robe. I suppose it was a handsome thing of black and green Chinese brocade with wide sleeves and a collar fastened high to her neck with jade buttons, and she was sitting cross-legged on the divan, surrounded with cushions, watching Pamela at work. It struck me at once how oddly right both her robe and her attitude were. Plainly, like so many Russians, she was of Mongol blood, and in that dress somehow she seemed to fit better into this setting than into any other. She was smoking a cigarette in a foot-long jade holder and plainly talking to Pamela as a child moved about. I watched Pamela finish her job of clearing the table and setting the room to rights as I turned to the older woman and asked a question, probably as to whether she would wash up the supper things. However, whatever it was, the older woman vetoed it and motioned Pamela to sit down at the table, open a drawer and, it, and get out a pile of exercise books. I saw Pamela look towards the divan with rather a rueful pout. Evidently, she was in no mood to tackle German now. And for some odd reason, I felt disappointed. Surely my hunch and pen or your sensings were not going to peter out into a mere conscientious teacher giving a promising pupil an extra lesson, but I jumped to a hasty conclusion. Obediently, Pamela took up a chair and settled herself to work. I had known that she often did her homework under her teacher's eyes, yet somehow I had not expected it to happen this particular night after the excitement of the party. The room grew quiet, and in the background the princess still sat upright, cross-legged on her cushions, smoking motionless as a carven image, motionless as a gilded Buddha perched high up on his lacquered shelf against the wall. The absurd thought struck me that she looked very much like the Buddha. The attitude, the poise were exactly the same, but that Buddha had one hand raised in blessing and she. Yet even as I looked, she laid her cigarette carefully in the ashtray on the little table beside the divan, raising her hand even as the Buddha had raised his, held it steadily palm forward with her eyes directed at the unconscious girl as she bent over her books. There was a moment's pause, and then I saw something more than curious. I saw what seemed like five threads of silvery light begin to ray out from the tips of the princess's fingers and stream towards Pamela. They were no thicker than a silk thread, yet I could see them clearly, silvery in color, but with a curious greenish sheen that somehow I did not like at all. And they streamed out sheer across the room and fastened on Pam, one attached itself to the back of her neck, another to the top of her head, another to her forehead, another to the base of her throat, and the fifth to her heart. And once attached, they seemed to swell and grow and pulsate like living things. The sight was so uncanny that I gave a sharp exclamation of revulsion, and Penoy's hand came firmly down on mine. He spread his left hand over the globe, and at once the picture faded. The glass became dull, and I was back in the normal present, glaring at Pen in fury mixed with anger and completely bewildered. Pen. What on earth is it? I burst out. It was horrible. Those rays or threads passing onto Pam. Tentacles, I would rather call them, said Pam calmly. You're right. It was horrible. For the woman is drawing vitality from Pam to keep herself alive. She knows plenty about magic, for only a magician can do what we saw her doing. Set a psychic pump to work on a younger being in order to provide herself with a vitality that she no longer possesses. They knew about it in biblical days. Of course, remember giving the aged King David a young virgin to lie in his bosom to give him back his strength? There was nothing sexual about that and nothing actually magical such as we have just seen. Just the knowledge that the aged can and do draw vitality from the younger, only too often to prop up their weakening powers. I know something about that, I said, because nowadays doctors won't have children sleeping in their grandparents' room as so often used to happen. They know it is bad for them. Of course it is, said Penn. Thank goodness, in that respect, at all events, we have learned a little wisdom, but this, this is a thousand times worse, this damn woman, if she is a woman at all. I was startled and interrupted. Oh, surely I began, but Penn swept on. Oh, I don't mean she isn't a woman. Physically speaking, I mean that the entity who is incarnated in her body is essentially male. And that so is one of the reasons why she, he, is able to handle and attract women so successfully. Again, there is nothing sexual about it, 
In the lesbian sense, I mean. It's a psychological matter. Psychologically, women sense the male and a strong male within the princess and so gravitate towards her. That's the reason why both Dolly and Pamela and doubtless a lot of other women before them have fallen under this infernal woman's spell. I must break it, for without it, yes, I prompted him. He hesitated a moment and faced me squarely, seriously. Look here, Jerry. I don't want to be a gloom merchant, but this is serious. You saw the psychic pump at work, sucking out the very life force of the child to be drawn into and used by this evil thing on the divan. You've seen how changed and white and listless Pamela has become since she met this so-called princess. Well, unless we can stem this flow of vitality from her to the princess, sooner or later she'll die for a sheer lack of strength to keep alive. She'll be sucked dry. I have no manner of doubt that the princess has done this before, possibly many times before. She's a psychic vampire and there is no viler magic than hers. There is no knowing her real age, but I'm positive she is vastly older than she seems. But don't despair, Jerry. Go home and get to sleep. And tomorrow I will see you again and tell you what I think we may be able to do. It's no use talking to Arnold and Dolly, I suppose, I said. Penn shook his head. Not a scrap, he said firmly. Arnold would only laugh and think me crazy. And Dolly, who is completely under this woman's spell, would be offended. And we should get nowhere. No, I must handle this alone. And now, get along. I could not get to Pam's birthday party after all, as a few days after my talk with Penn Oyer, I went down with a nasty chill and had to stay in bed for several days with a high temperature, feeling very sorry for myself. I sent a check to Dolly to spend on a present for my goddaughter, and she bought her a red suede handbag that she assured me she envied most heartily, and twice I tried to get Penn Oyer to come and chat to me to beguile a few of the weary hours I had to spend in bed. But old Friedel told me that my friend had departed to Paris on some mysterious errand the very day after we had seen the princess and her pupil, her victim rather, I now realized, in the globe. So I had to possess my soul in patience until I got on my feet again, and the first night I felt fit enough I went to Amherst Court to dine. Pam greeted and thanked me for a present very sweetly, though without the old exuberance that she used to show, and I scanned her young face as I kissed her with more than my old anxiety. She looked, I thought, even wider and more listless than before, and now I knew what she was being used for, what that devil in female form was trying to do. Everything in me was up in arms with fear and anger both, and I was wild to find some sort of an excuse to break off these damn lessons, separate the teacher and the taught, but what on earth could I do? With Dolly, poor darling, smiling smugly on the situation, I simply hadn't to hope. For the first time since I'd known her, I felt like I'd have shaken the little woman for her stupidity, for her obstinacy. Yet even as I felt the impulse, I dismissed it as unfair. How could she be expected to understand? As Penn had said, if I had tried to explain, she would have simply considered the whole idea crazy, as Arnold would do so likewise. So I stifled my feelings as best I could, and we sat down to dinner as usual. Needless to say, after touching on various other subjects, such as my recent illness and Penn's visit to Paris, which since to Dolly Paris meant clothes and to Arnold women, neither of them could understand what should take Penn there. The talk gravitated to that damn princess, but this time Pam had something really interesting to say. You know, Mummy, she said, I'm not the only one that's been having presents. The princess had one today. She's so intrigued with it because she can't think who it's from. Dolly's eyes were round with interest. Can't think who it's from, she repeated. But how very odd. Did it come by post? Oh, yes, said Pam, eating her grilled chicken with relish. It came from abroad, Rome, I think, all quartered up in a wooden box with seals and things and stuffed inside with shavings. Wasn't there a card inside, I asked? Pam shook her head. No, I suppose a person who sent it meant to put a card in it and forgot. Isn't it maddening? The princes and I packed it together and went through every inch, but there wasn't any sign of a card or note and she's going nearly mad trying to figure out who sent it. Well, is it worth all that careful packing? asked Arnold. I don't think so, said Pam, frowning. It's an old metal thing, like a sort of wheel stuck on a long metal stem with a foot to it. Some antique thing or other. I never saw anything like it before and can't imagine what it's used for. Can the princess? I asked. I think she knows what it is, but can't make out why it's been sent to her, said Pam, and her eyes suddenly lighted up. I know. Will you come round to her flat 
with me after dinner, Uncle Jerry, and have a look at it? I'm sure the princess would love you to come. I'll come with pleasure, I said, which was true, for some inner instinct told me that it was important I should see this thing, somewhere behind this mysterious present mover Penoyer. I was sure. Certainly, Rome puzzled me, as Friedel had said Penn had gone to Paris. But it would not be the first time that Penn had deliberately confused his tracks, and that this thing, whatever it was, had come from him or via him. I felt positive. After we had coffee, Dolly telephoned the princess to ask if it would be convenient for me to come over and see the curio about which Pam had told us. I was, she said, a connoisseur of such things. The princess welcomed the idea enthusiastically, and Pam and I went up to the little door at the angle of the stairs. The flat was filled with the smell of incense as before. The princess had a passion for the heavy musky scent, which I personally detest, and she greeted us eagerly. But how charming of you, Mr. Latimer, to come and try to explain my mystery. Behold it as it stands. She threw out both hands dramatically towards the object standing on a small round table just below the Buddha, and I recognized it at once. It was a small Tibetan prayer wheel, one of those used by the high lamas in the monasteries of Tibet, and plainly an ancient one, and I should judge a very valuable one. It was of bronze, turned greenish with age, the rim and the spokes of the wheels were pierced in pattern work, and the stem was covered with a close ornamentation of hammered and embossed metal. I picked it up, touching it delicately, and at my touch the wheel whirred instantly. Old as it plainly was, it had been so well made that not even years in tarnishing and inevitable battering it had undergone, for it was dented in several places had sufficed to upset the beautiful balance of the wheel upon its supporting stem. I replaced it carefully, glancing up as I did so at the poker-faced Buddha on his lacquered shelf above. I remember thinking as I did so how well the two seemed to belong together. It's an old Tibetan prayer wheel, and a valuable one, I should judge, I said. What a very interesting present to receive, madame. And yet Pam tells me, you do not know who sent it to you. The princess shrugged and spread out her hands. No, but this is fantastic. There is nothing, no card, no message. And yet I will give anything to know who sends me so wonderful, so thrilling a present. Her long fingers touched the wheel and set it twirling again. One is supposed to say a prayer for each turn around. But how exciting. I must read up something about this in the encyclopedia. I know so very little, and yet this fascinates me more than I can say. She touched it again, and the touch was almost loving. Oh, who could have sent it to me? I think I shall really die of mortification if I cannot find out. I picked up the paper wrapping of the box that still lay on the floor and studied the big red blob of sealing wax that had fastened the stout ring around it. The blob had been broken in two pieces, but so solid were they that it was possible to put the two bits together and see the design of the seal that had been used to stamp the wax. It was a double-headed bird of some sort, with a shield held in its claws. There was a flamboyant crest on the shield and a motto below. I held it out. Perhaps this seal might give you a clue, madame. Is it one you recognize? I should think it's Austrian or perhaps Russian. She clutched it eagerly, studied it for a moment, then relaxed with a smile of gratification. I should have thought of that, she ejaculated. But of course I know it. This is the crest of the Galinov family. One of the oldest in Russia, ruined and driven out like so many others in the revolution. But I used to know many of them in Paris. Her hooded eyes studied the seal closely. I, yes, it must be that one of them has remembered me and found me out where I live. I wonder who it could be. There were three brothers I used to know when I was young. Ivan and Mikhail and Serge. And they were all in love with me. It looks, I said guilefully as though one of them at least is still in love with you. The woman tossed her rust-colored hair and smiled the smile of a woman whose vanity is pleased, though with her expressive hands she made a gesture as though disclaiming my compliment. Then she patted me on the cheek and cried out that she was delighted, delighted, and that we must now drink some coffee with her and have perhaps a tiny drink of anisette or pernod to toast a new treasure. We stayed another half hour, it would have been difficult, if not discourteous, to refuse, and much of the time, of course, was taken up in gleeful speculation by both the princess and her pupil as to how the donor of the present could have discovered her address, which brother it was, and whether he was likely to follow up his present with a personal visit, which the infatuated Pam was quite positive would happen. We took our leave, and the moment I found myself back in my own rooms, tired as I was by that time, I rang up Penn's flat. 
His voice answered me, and he laughed as I threw out my challenge. Yes, of course, he said. I went to Paris all right, but as it was essential that my hand in this matter should never be suspected, when I had got the thing I went for safely in my possession, I flew to Rome with it and dispatched it from there. I sealed it with an old Russian seal I picked up in a junk shop, hoping she'd recognize it, as you say she did. When I sent the box off, I hopped into a plane, and here I am. But how on earth did you get the thing? Tell me, I demanded. Not over the telephone, said Penn firmly. It's a nefarious tale, and I'm not going to broadcast it. Come and have dinner with me tomorrow night, and I'll tell you all about it. And later on, we'll have a look at you know what. Good night. Though Friedel's English is still very rudimentary in spite of the years she had spent in Penn's service, Penn refused to discuss the matter that was so intriguing me until after dinner, and I was so excited that I must confess to bolting my food without my usual appreciation of its excellence. Directly, we had adjourned to the sitting room and the coffee we placed before us, and the door closed behind Friel's substantial form. Pen began. First, I must confess to having done a spot of burglary over the prayer wheel. I knew there were several in the British Museum, but that was too hard a crib to crack. So I telephoned to a Buddhist friend of mine, and he told me of a small temple in the heart of Paris, of all places. It belonged to a Buddhist brotherhood, but was closed and locked except when they gathered there about once a month and only the concierge of the building where it was located ever went in to clean or dust it. I went over and found this place, and to my relief found the concierge both old and decidedly bilbous. I put on a French working man's clothes and beret, and took a big basket of vegetables to sell, got acquainted with the old boy who was alone, his wife had gone to the country, jollied him along with plenty of dope wine, and when he was snoring, stole the keys from his pocket. Walked in, lifted the prayer wheel, hid it under the vegetables in my basket, locked it and replaced the keys and walked out. How on earth will you explain it to the Brotherhood if they have a meeting and miss it, I said. Penn shrugged. Let's hope I can replace it as I removed it, he said. But the need was so urgent that I had to risk that. Why did you need it? And what has it to do with the princess, I asked. I told you, said Penoyer, that in essentials she's a man and I am right. More, I knew when I was looking in on her that night what sort of a man she was. She was a lama and one of her previous incarnations, and a great one, though an evil one. She is drawn to this wheel because of her ancient inner memories that know a prayer wheel's value. But what she does not know is that this particular wheel once belonged to the great Nam Pen, one of the great lamas, but as white as she was once black. And you think I prompted? As Penoyer paused. Once again, as I've done many times before, he said, I am pitting the forces of good against the forces of evil and praying that they will win. If this woman had had her old knowledge of magic, which luckily she has not, she would never have allowed the prayer wheel into her flat, for it is the thin edge of the wedge, the spearhead inserted into a crack that I hope will burst right open. Now, tonight, once again, we will look into the globe and see what we shall see. Once more, Penoyer placed his hands on my forehead at the back of my neck and then over my ears, for a reason I did not understand until later, and in the dusk room we sat watching the globe as it misted it over, cleared and showed us sharply, as though we actually sat there in our bodily selves, the sitting room of the princess at Amherst Court. The room was dimly lighted, with a red lamp before the Buddha, and blue curls of fresh incense were rising lazily into the air from the metal vase on the shelf beside it. The princess, clad in the Chinese robe I had seen before, sat cross-legged on the van against the richly colored spread of the ancient carpet that hung on the wall behind it. Her tousled red head was bent as she studied the prayer wheel, held cup in her two strong hands. For a long time she stared at it, and then with an exasperated sigh put it down on a small table beside the divan, chose and lighted a cigarette. It was plain that though the thing fascinated her, she was still at a loss to understand either its arrival or its fascination, and as her head bending over the flame of a cigarette lighter, was temporarily averted from the prayer wheel, I saw what was happening before she did. It seemed that a tall column of silvery mist was forming itself against the dusk of the room, just behind the shape of the prayer wheel. Swiftly, the column took shape and substance, and before I could blink, a tall man stood there, a man wearing the yellow robes and the curiously shaped red headgear of a Tibetan lama of one of the highest orders, the Lai Tamkoi. His lean aesthetic face was worn and lined, 
his lips thin and firmly set and his eyes set in deep hollows. It was a face weary with years and experience, a face learned and sad both. Yet as he watched the bent head of the woman on the divan, there was no harshness in his eyes, only pity and sorrow. Her head was still bent when he spoke to her, and then I knew that Penn had unclosed my psychic hearing as well as my sight, for I could hear their voices as clearly as I could have heard my own. Well, Lom Chang, so you are at your tricks again? The redhead shot up with a cry of mortal terror, and she sat rigid, hands gripping the rug each side of her, her blazing eyes wide as lamps, staring at the priest who faced her, one long hand resting lightly on the prayer rail. You! You! She managed to sob out hoarsely, and he nodded. You remember me, and my warnings to you, he said quietly, in the old days of the monastery that we both remember so well. You used the blood of the living young to keep your fading body alive and vital. Here again I see you robbing the young, but now of the life force itself, not merely the blood. Oh, Lom Chang, Lom Chang, will you never learn? As he spoke, I was staring at the princess, and my eyes bulged amazed. For as I stared, lo and behold, she changed. From a russet-haired, haggard, yet handsome woman, she changed before my eyes, and in her place I saw a hawk-faced, shaven-headed priest. Crouched together, his narrow eyes filled with fear and hate both. He sat motionless on the divan, his hands buried in the sleeves of his robe, his bloodless lips a thin line in the yellow mask of his face. Yet terrified as he plainly was, he did not lack courage as he snarled out, Life? Life? Is any price too high to pay for it? The tall priest, confronting him, nodded his stately head. It is indeed. Yet you have not learnt that, it seems. From afar on the other side of this life, we have watched you, Lom Chang, through many incarnations, and seen you, alas, at your evil work again and yet again. Anything to keep the life flame burning in that wretched physical body that you prize so highly. Anything. We have watched you fasten on this English child with sorrow and amazement. But thanks to the wise man who brought this holy wheel into touch with you and so gave me the opportunity I needed, your evil project is vain. The child shall be freed, and you, Lom Chang, will go on to your own place there to meet your fellows and your judges and have the doom meted out to you that you have, alas, so well and truly earned. Even in the dim light of the room, I could see the beads of sweat of terror that pearled the high, bald forehead of the thing on the divan, and I could see him shaking as he tried fiercely to master his fears. His voice came in a harsh croak. No, no, I will not let her go. It is only the strength that I draw from her that keeps his physical body alive. I dare not let her go. You have no choice, said the tall priest, whom now I knew to be none other than the great Nam Pen, the white lama of whom Penoyer had spoken to me, the original owner of the prayer wheel. Prepare, Lom Chang, for your span of time on this earth is over. He raised his hands on high, reverently holding the prayer wheel, and I saw him set it spinning furiously as his lips moved in a strange unearthly sound, half chant, half prayer. The figure in the Chinese robe sprang convulsively to its feet, trying to snatch at the upraised wheel, but even as it moved it collapsed, falling together like a mechanical doll, the springs of which had suddenly given out. The yellow-robed figure seemed to swell and grow to giant size. The chanting rang and boomed in my ears, and suddenly the scene vanished. The globe was once more an ordinary ball of crystal, and in the dimness, Penoyer and I sat staring at each other. Pen rose to his feet and went to fetch the tray of drinks from the sideboard. So that's the end, he said. I wondered how it would come, but I never dreamed that the white lama himself would come to deliver punishment and take back his prayer wheel. So Lom Chang has gone to his account and thank the gods your little goddaughter is free. You mean he, she, the princess is dead? I said, Pen nodded. Oh yes, dead, thank heaven, as she, he can be. Like you, I really don't know what to call her. You saw her tonight in her true colors. She who was once a very great lama, until she took to twisting the laws of magic to suit her own evil ends. What she was doing to Pamela as she had done many times before in earlier lives to other young people, but in a cruder way. Do you mean actually drawing their blood? I asked. It seems, well, almost impossible to believe. For the blood is the life, quoted Penoyer, as he poured me out of whiskey and soda. You may or may not know, Jerry, that to this day there are certain extremely advanced souls inhabiting human bodies 
who know how by conserving their vital energies in various magical ways to lengthen the physical life of their bodies to an inconceivable extent. Only in those in the remote corners of the world do you find these men, chosen souls who after long and arduous training in their far-off cells or monasteries know how to turn the lamp of physical life so low that it is almost extinguished that they can leave their bodies motionless, lying for months at a time, cared for and guarded by a few devoted young disciples, while the freed spirits rove the earth even further and further afield. Some of these men can and do visit other planets and confer with the wise folk there, and bring back vast stores of knowledge with them. This, when at last they awake to full physical life on this earth again, they share and discuss with their fellow workers, and use for the benefit of mankind until such time as the call comes again, to them to leave their bodies and go journeying. What an amazing idea, I said wonderingly. Do you mean the bodies they leave need no food or drink or anything? They need nothing, for the flame of life has been turned so low, they can live on almost indefinitely in that semi-cataleptic state, said my friend. But in order to do this, to learn to draw only on the spirit for the force that keeps that flame alive, takes much arduous and exhausting training of many years, and is also, alas, possible, and much easier to keep life alive for many years beyond the normal span by drawing on the actual lifeblood of others, which was the sin for which you heard Lam Chang's sentence. He poured himself out a glass of lime juice, added sugar, and took a long drink. Too impatient to go through the bitter training he should have faced, he took the easier way and for a long time lived on the lifeblood of the young disciples who thronged about him to learn of him, for he was famed for his learning then, and many young people came from far parts of Tibet to study under his wing. But gradually, here one and there one grew oddly weak and pale, and at last died, and those in charge of the monastery set a watch and found out what was happening. Pen drew a long breath. Long Chang died, died very horribly, as he deserved to die. But as you have seen, his spirit is still rebellious and still bent on evil ends. He has grown subtler since those days, certainly. Now he no longer draws the blood from the living body, but works on the psychic life force, which is worse still. Your Pamela does not know, thank God, why she has escaped. I shivered. I don't know, and I don't want to know, but I can't tell you how grateful I am to you, Penoyer, and how grateful Pam's mother and father ought to be, and won't be since they don't know anything about this. Pen smiled. I don't want thanks, he said gently, and I know he spoke the truth. I'm only so thankful and so grateful to the great ones I serve that my ruse has turned out so wonderfully successful. And now I'm going to send you home to bed, Jerry, a wiser and a much happier man than when you came, and look out for some announcement of the princess's death in the papers. I rather think you'll find something interesting there. I did indeed. The princess may discover her body lying prone in death on the floor beside the divan, and raised a frightful screech which brought in the police almost at once, to my great relief in time to prevent Pam's going into the flat and finding the body, which I had been afraid of knowing how often she ran in and out. But as luckily the princess never got up until 11 o'clock, the body and the flat had both been examined and the body removed before Pam and her parents knew what was happening. The news came as a great shock to both Pam and her mother, of course, and on Dolly's agitated phone call, I went round to do what I could to steady them both up, but there was little to be said. The inquest brought in the death as a sudden apoplectic stroke, and it was one of the smaller, more sensational rags that printed a par about the deceased that gave me, as the saying is furiously to think, it ran something like this. A curious feature of the death from an apoplectic stroke of the Princess Olga Sophia Alexander Euphemia Yurikos Davosky emerged at the inquest. Though those who knew the princess and life refused to accept her as being more than 58 or 60 at most, the doctor examined the body gave the day woman's age as incredibly old, so old that it was beyond him to understand how she had been kept alive, and further, he was by no means certain that she was a woman at all, certainly to use his own discreet words, not a complete and normal woman, by which possibly the good doctor means she was a hermaphrodite. The whole matter remains a considerable puzzle. When I consulted Penoyer about the paragraph, he smiled. I rather thought that would happen, he said. No, I don't mean that in this life she was physically a hermaphrodite. I should very much doubt it. But I do think that since the moment of her death, 
which was from sheer fright, of course, and no stroke at all. She was wearing the semblance of her old maleness that left an imprint, as her actual age also did, on the physical body she was wearing. The body appeared to the good doctor, who must have been puzzled to a degree, poor chap, as both semi-male and incredibly old. Actually, I'm surprised the physical body even held together, struck as it was at the moment of death with the repercussions of the actual years she had kept it alive. I've no doubt that woman was probably well over 150, and if we could only know her history, has kept herself alive and vital and comparatively young for untold years by using young things as she was trying to use Pamela, pumping them full of life stream in order to renew her own. It doesn't bear thinking of. Another thing that's odd, I said. There's nothing about the prayer wheel, and I gather from Pam, that has disappeared. Nam Pen took it with him, said Pen. Not but anything you like, it's now reposing where I took it from, in the Buddhist temple in Paris, and that it's never been missed. Next time I go over, I'll get in touch with my friend, the concierge, and find out. But I'm sure I'm right. And of course, he was.